This is a video from the Canadian Standards Association. I get this, asked this question all the time. What about hail damage for solar panels? This is a little video that I've edited and cut out a lot of it. So this is um, Canadian Standards Association. Uh, the other uh, certifying body is the Underwriter Laboratories in the United States. These two bodies certify uh, manufacturers that they build a quality product. And so what they do this, they drop the steel ball on the glass, and it's tempered glass, and if it breaks, well, you don't get your certification. And uh, same with the uh, little tractor thing they drag across is a glass cutter. They drag a glass cutter across it, and if it cuts it, it doesn't pass. So the reason I play this is to show you that uh, they're designed to withstand a fairly hefty impact, okay? Uh, most solar panel and solar modules mounted at an angle, so when hail hits them, they bounce off anyways. Because if you put a CSA approved certified uh, module on your home, you can tell your home insurance company that, and they won't increase your premium, and they'll cover it. So if you have a catastrophic hail damage, your home insurance should cover it, okay? If you don't use a certified product and your home burns down, you're out of luck. You've got a $400,000 pile of ash that you've got to pay a mortgage on. So I get to that later in the discussion. When you consider putting solar in your home, don't cheap out. Don't buy something off Kijiji. Don't buy made in Taiwan, container full of you know, cheap solar modules. You know, if you're gonna do that, put it on your garden shed. Don't put it on your house. The other question I get asked a lot, well, I have a 1,400 square foot house. How much solar do I need to, to offset that? It has absolutely nothing to do with the size of your house, okay? Unless you heat with electricity. Air conditioning runs on electricity, so if you have air conditioning, that has a sum of an effect to it. These are two houses, 100 years old, 85 years old, roughly the same size. One of these houses uses seven times as much electricity as the other, okay? It has nothing to do, there's one house in between them. This has nothing to do with the size of the house. It's how you use electricity. It's totally up to you. This is my meter on my house. This is a bi-directional meter. It's part of the microgen regulation. Over here it says zero 01 and over here it says zero 02. This is the power that I bought. This is the power that I sell. You can actually see that I've sold more than I bought. It happens. I'm going to buy power in the wintertime when the days are short, and I'm going to sell power in the summertime when the days are longer, and I don't have as many lights on, and I don't have a furnace fan running, and all that kind of stuff. Okay? Uh, most people's meters will not look like that. That's after four years. Okay, I, I don't use very much electricity. This is my wife here, and she's mostly responsible for that. <laughs> Alberta microgeneration regulation. So this regulation was brought in in January 2009. Before that, if you had solar on your home, you just gave it away. You could get paid for it. You could pay the fees that EPCOR paid, and TransAlta paid, and ATCO paid. Any idea what ACO pays for fees in a year for generating? No. You couldn't afford it. You would have to pay these fees. You'd have to do the bookkeeping. You'd have to send in a data once a month to the um, AESO saying, I've generated this much power. Can I get paid for 50 cents, please? So people would just gave it away. It just went out to the community, and your neighbors got green power. So they brought this regulation in. It was a good thing. So now, if you use a certified product, and you get it inspected by an electrical inspector, the utility cannot prevent you from connecting to the utility grid, okay? And they have to give you this meter for free. Okay, they can't stop you. So the, those two things, the government did well, okay? The thing that irks me is that it's limited to your, oops, push the wrong button, it's limited to what you consume on an annual basis. So you can't get a system bigger, can't move, you can't generate any more electricity than what you would use over the course of a year, okay? 
ish. There's a little wiggle room there. But that's the intent. The intent is to offset your own personal consumption, not to put EPCOR out of business or capital power. You know, they don't want you putting capital power out of business. They want you just to offset your own consumption, okay? So even if you had, even if you were a billionaire and you wanted to put this on your house, you could do it. They just don't have to pay you for it, okay? You can do whatever the heck you like, okay? It's just that they don't have to, if they catch you, they don't have to give you credit for the excess power, okay? Beyond what you consume. Yep, question in the back. Now, the question was, do I know of any cases where the credit's never been paid for an excess? And I, and I don't know of one. My office, isn't, as Rob mentioned, is a net zero building. It has an eight and a half kilowatt array on it. I was renovating the building. I put solar on it first. I net generated a lot the first year, okay? They never said anything. But if they catch you, then they have the right to, to get the money back or something like that. So th this is the risk. You can do whatever the heck you like. It's only when you get caught. You can speed. It's only when you get caught you have to pay the fine. Yeah, Ben? Yeah, they can refuse the credit. As far as I know, they, I guess if, you, if they felt you stole enough money from them, they could take you to court, I suppose. I don't know. I, I can't imagine that they would do that. It would be embarrassing for them. And from the discussion I've had with EPCOR, I would be highly surprised if they'd actually figure it out. <laughs> Some very nice people worked there. Don't get me wrong. And they have all the right intentions, okay? But it's a big organization. Okay. So I don't know if everybody heard that question, but the question is, is there a time of day uh, metering? So the concept of that time of day metering is, and some jurisdictions do that. So basically, it, when you're sleeping, you don't use much electricity, so it's not worth very much. Uh, not everybody sleeps at the same time, but generally, at night, power's not worth as much. So what happens is actually the utilities go out and they incent people to use electricity at night. So that's why you have street lights and where you see all half the offices downtown all lit up at night is because they actually incent them to do that. And one of the reasons for that is a good reason is because you don't want all the lights to come on and all at the same time because the grid will crash. Okay. And so they want to kind of pre-charge the grid a little bit. Okay. But they also have this excess power that they don't know what to do with and they don't want to shut off the coal plant. So they pay people by lowering the rate to burn up electricity at night. But generally speaking, we use a lot more electricity during the day than we do at night. And so it's worth more. This is the way the market works. This is a free market system. The problem in Alberta is they don't incent you that way. And they do in some jurisdictions. And so what ne what's required is a special meter that actually keeps track of the time of day that you're using the power. And then at night, you would pay two cents for electricity. And during the day, you would pay 15 cents for electricity. And so if you had solar, you'd get paid 15 cents during the day, and then you'd do your dishes at night when you're sleeping, and you'd pay two cents to do the dishes. Because they all have timers. All your dishwashers have timers. So in some jurisdictions where you see this, that's what happens. And they do it for that very reason. They want to encourage you to take the peak load away. Because you pay a lot for peaking, okay? The grid's like twice as big and you have all this peak generation that never gets used except for a few days of the year. And you pay for all that on the off chance that you get a peak demand and you need to crank that stuff on. And the lights stay on. They're doing a good job. When they first brought up, created utilities, that's what they told them, keep the lights on. And they're doing a great job. They really are. Like, I'm not even being uh, sarcastic about that, which is unusual for me. But um, I'm going to skip to the next one. So it's a very simple application, one page. It's a 40-page document that you get fall asleep by page 25. But near the back, they have this single-page application. If you hire a contractor to install it for you, most contractors are turnkey. They take care of everything for you. They do the paperwork for you as well. You have to sign it because it's a legal document. But that's all you have to do. They have to fill it in. The only thing that's really interesting here from your guys' perspective is down here somewhere in the form, you fill in the size of your annual consumption and the size of the system that's gonna go on your house. And the utility looks at the two numbers and goes, yeah, that's about right. You also have to send in a copy of your utility bill as part of this, okay? Um, that's quite simple. In terms of municipal permits, anybody within the city of Edmonton and the surrounding area, typically we've had to do a building permit 
The reason for this is because the solar panels could fly off the building, so there's some structural issues there, okay, and also the electrical permit. The City of Edmonton, we've been talking with them as a society and convinced them to uh, go to what's known as a solar combo permit, and so they're going to have a one permit now. Very simple, very fast. It takes a building permit, it takes a month at best to get. And so this should be a walk in, get the permit, walk out, solar combo permit. And it's going to go from probably around $400, 250 something like that. Dep <coughs> depends on it, uh, to 100 It's going to go from, say, 250 to 100 So it'll drop a lot. And it'll be a streamlined process. So it'll be much better for that. And this is for flush-mounted systems. And the flush-mounted system is one that's like right on the roof. Okay, it's a few inches above the roof. Because the wind doesn't catch it very much. It's right close to your roof. If it's installed properly, the wind doesn't really get underneath and blow it off. Okay, so there's no need for that. Calgary's had that for six years, I think, where you've never had to get a building permit. So Edmonton's kept you over the winter. They've already implemented it. They just haven't finalized it yet. But it will occur. Nobody, nobody pulls a permit for solar in the winter time. So it'll be over the winter sometime. But if you live outside Edmonton, you may still have to do a building permit. Every municipal district has a different code for this, okay? It just depends on their comfort factor with it. As, as more and more solar gets installed, you'll start to see these things drop away, okay? But these are some of the soft costs, okay? Um, because you also require a structural engineer to stamp it and sign it, okay? So you gotta pay an engineer, okay? So it's like a thousand bucks you know, for the time for me to stand at the desk to get a permit done, the cost of the permit, the cost of the engineer, all this kind of stuff, it's like $1,000. Now it's $100. So it's quite a drop, okay? A uh, single line diagram, which is like a schematic site plan. I recommend a shade analysis. This is for your benefit. And you know, what it does is it, the contractor should come out and use a, a special tool that measures the shade on your site, okay? And it compares it against an ideal situation where if you had no shade and tells you how much of a loss your site will be. So it's comparing your site to an ideal site. And so you just can't put solar in your house and, and produce, I said earlier, 1,250 kilowatt hours. If there's a shade there, it's going to reduce that. Okay. And so then you can, as a consumer, you can decide, do I cut the tree down? Do I get a bigger system? Do I relocate it somewhere? These, so these are decisions that are really critical. And so if you hire a turnkey installer, they should do a shade analysis. They should not skip that, okay? It's good at site helps too. So this happens to be my house. You've seen it in a couple of pictures already. It's a crappy solar site, okay? My neighbor, he has a two-story house right next to mine. I live in a mature neighborhood, lots of old mature trees, big. I got no sun at all. Face is east. This is east. But I have a garage, and that's where my solar is. It's on my garage. And I have a really sweet neighbor. Even though he has a two-story house, he let me cut his tree down. And so he's a very nice neighbor. So I don't, when he violates the certain laws, I never rat on him. <laughs> this is the building plans for a new home. Did Rajiv come here today? I don't know, one of the guys, a guy contacted me a while ago, bought a house, he's going to buy a house in Oxford Developments, which is a city development, the city's the developer. Every house in that development has to be solar ready, what they call solar ready. This is the south base of the house. Okay. You'd be lucky to squeeze one and a half, two kilowatts onto that. Okay. So we don't do ourselves any favors on the urban planning side, and the city realizes this too. So the city has no control over developers, okay? The building code is provincial. The city has no say on that at all. And where they have a say is when they're the developer. So Blatchford Field, the airport redevelopment, I hope they get this right. Part of the problem we have is when you build in crescents and cul-de-sacs, the houses are oriented, not necessarily facing south. He has enough roof space on the sides, probably to do six or eight kilowatts but it faces east and west. Now, you can still get electricity from that, but it's not as ideal. And so you get less electricity and spend more money. So it's more of a challenge. If you have 
if you live in a mature neighborhood and you have a garage that's detached, make it face south, like this guy, okay? When he first approached me, um, and, and this is from my company, not from the society, okay? But we just did this one. This was what he had for space, this little bit on his house. That's two kilowatts, okay? So if we put four and a, another four and a half on the garage, okay? There's no way we would have even approached 100% of his consumption if it was just the house, okay? So this is, this is normal. You build these pyramid-shaped houses, roofs like this, cottage slopes, so you don't shade your neighbor, and you put all these dormers on it and everything, and it looks very nice and very, I don't know, Victorian or something, but it's awful for solar, awful. So when you're, if you're gonna build a house, you know, build it the old-fashioned way. Simple gable roof facing south, and don't put any chimneys on this side. Put all your chimneys on the other side. This is a breakdown of a typical photovoltaic system. Um, so on the roof, we have what are known as modules. Everybody calls them panels, but that's not, actually not technically correct. Where's Gordon? I don't even get an attaboy for that. Anyway, um, so they're called modules. Typically, 250 watts-ish, okay? And there is a reason for that. The program in Ontario, the incentive is driven towards 250 watts. So all the domestic suppliers, that's what they stock. 250 watts-ish in that range, okay? So it's maybe 245, 265, but in that area. So this creates DC, direct current, like a battery. Runs into, in this case, I show it as a box, but I'll show later it's not necessarily a box. This is what's known as an inverter. It changes the DC voltage to an AC and current to AC, alternating current. And the reason for this is because you don't have any appliances in your home that run on DC. And so all your appliances are AC, so it converts it for you, okay? They have a built-in, then it feeds into the breaker panel. I put that in yellow because you already have a breaker panel. This is not something you get with the system. You might have to add it if you're over capacity. It's typically just a double pole breaker, 15 amp, double 15 or double 30, depending on the size of your system. Relatively simple, okay? Um, special meter, as I mentioned, known as the bi-directional meter. Internet monitoring. It's pretty standard today to have internet monitoring on your system. Smartphone, computer, whatever. You can look at your system. Nice hot day, you're having a beer with your buddies on the patio. You can show them how much money you just made. Um, all that kind of stuff. No batteries required, okay? This is grid tied. Um, the standard around the world today. Very rarely do you see battery based. This is a concept, I'm not sure if I'm gonna spend much time on this. Um, the question was, we don't get paid when we sell the power. We don't get a transmission fee for that. And so when you generate power and it goes out the meter and onto the line, and goes to your neighbor's house, because that's where it's gonna go, it's gonna go to your neighbor's house, he pays EPCOR, the transmission charge for that, okay? EPCOR doesn't care who the generator is. They own the wire. They get paid for moving electricity on the wire, okay? But for you, when you're trying to calculate, you know, what is the cost of this, you're gonna get a little transmission charge. If you buy electricity, you're gonna get a little transmission charge. So that becomes part of your cost, okay? And it totally depends on your lifestyle, okay? So if you stay at home, if you're retired, or you're a stay-at-home mom with kids, or stay-at-home dad with kids, or whatever, and you're home all the time, or you have a home-based business, and you're using a lot of electricity during the day, you might not avoid as much electricity not bought. Okay, if you don't have any kids and you both work or you are by yourself and you're not home during the day, you probably don't use much electricity. So maybe all the electricity that you generate during the day, you're selling, okay? So this ratio depends totally on the different people, okay? But you have basically three parts of it. Electricity that you don't buy. You generate your own power, you use that first, okay? If you used it all up, and you need more than you buy from the grid. If, you, if, you, if you're generating more electricity than you're using at the moment, then you sell the difference, okay? So there's three things. There's electricity that you don't buy, there's electricity that you do buy, and then there's electricity that you sell. And the ratio of that could be anything. It could be 50% that you don't buy, 25% that you sell, 25% you buy. It could be 75 that you don't buy, 10, 15. It could be 100. I don't know how you do it at 100, you have to burn candles at night or something. 
This is from my office. This is a smart energy meter where I monitor a lot of the big electrical loads in my home. The blue is the solar power production. This is a 24-hour cycle, midnight to midnight. Obviously, this is the morning, the night. It, there's two offices in a house on this. We provide all the electricity for it. Um, so at night, we buy electricity. The daytime, the sun comes up, we generate electricity. But we don't use as much as we generate. And so what we're using is the white part here, OK? So this is the energy, the electricity not bought from the grid. We are not buying this. We're selling what we don't use. OK? Does that make sense? This is the system you're going to buy. So when you come to these talks, somebody from the audience is going to go, well, what about this? I read this paper, and there's this new technology coming out, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you'll be dead before that comes to the market, OK? So these things are important. We have to do research. We have to continue to push the envelope on technology. OK, we have to look for better ways to do this, OK? But you can buy something off the shelf today, and it will work perfectly fine on you. Most people have enough roof space to generate enough electricity for their own use, OK? What you're going to get is a frame silicone wafer module, and it's going to be made out of 40 or 60, I can't even read my own writing, 60 polycrystalline cells. Don't get stuck on that. This is um, the highest volume that they can produce, OK? And because it's the highest volume, it's got the best price, OK? And unless you've got a funny application that you are really particular about something and you need a certain application for something, this is really what you're going to buy, OK? So we can talk about all the other fancy stuff after the talk's over. And it, the reason is, is because it's the most common globally, but also in Canada because the Ontario FIT program is mandating that you have to have that, OK? Ideally, if you have an ideal site, no shade, you've got no trees, you've just got a big, huge lawn in front of you, a schoolyard next door, you probably use a central string inverter. This is the traditional way of doing it, one inverter for the whole system. The reason for this is the bus cost. Okay? If you have a shaded site, it doesn't matter. Well, I shouldn't say that. It does matter, but there's options, okay? There's two technologies come on the market, particularly for urban dwellers. The one, the earliest one maybe, is what's known as a microinverter. Little box, sits on the back of the module, converts right away from DC to AC. So each module individually has AC power coming off of it. The advantage of this is if you have shade, partial shade on some part of the roof, it drops that module that's being shaded, but all the rest of them are cranking out 100%. Okay? If you have the older systems, they've improved this, but just as a generalization and simplification, these would, the output would be reduced. You shade part of the array, your whole array output drops. Okay? Then there's a third technology that's come along known as power optimizers, and it's a blend of the two. Centralized string, inverter, and on the roof, under each module, little power mo optimizers. Also look very similar to a microinverter. As a consumer, you wouldn't know the difference, OK? It's a little bit better price on bigger systems than on the microinverters. Microinverters are really great if you have a tiny system. If you have like five modules, I don't know why you'd bother, but anyways, if you had a small system like that, they're great for that, OK? They're also very independent. Um, some of the manufacturers have some very innovative technology in there. There's been a lot of improvement on the inverter side, OK? So because they're independent from each other, they'll produce more in a shady application, OK? And I've got this line here where there's slate safer, quote unquote, for first responders because they have a lower voltage. Because they're coming off the module with 120 or 240 volts AC, um, a central string uh, inverter can run up to 600 volts DC, OK? That can kill people. Right? This is why you should not do this yourself. If you're going to have a central string inverter and you're not an electrician, please don't install that yourself. You're easy to kill yourself with it. Okay? So uh, the microinverter is a little more idiot proof. And if you have a fire or something like that and the fire department has to get up on the roof, uh, it's a little safer for them uh, in terms of if something goes amiss. 
Okay? All of them can be combined in either a single phase or a three phase configuration. So for commercial applications, a lot of people have three phase power. You can use this with solar. Okay? Um, there are many types of solar modules. The traditional one that we know of is, is uh, we always think of as a silicone wafer. It's made from a very thin slice of silicone, which is laminated at the glass uh, to give it some structural integrity. Can be framed or not framed. It's cosmetic, really. What that is can be either black, blue, different colors. Can be made of two different kinds of wafers. It doesn't matter to you guys. Uh, polycrystalline is easier to make, but it's not as pure as the monocrystallines, and so you don't get it, the efficiencies off of it. But it's close for what you guys need. And you have them in different sizes: 60, 72, 96 cells. The cell is a little square thing that shows up on the silicon on the. Uh, uh, you can't really see. Okay, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, you guys don't care. You can have them in concentrated or conventional. I'm not going to talk about concentrated. Nobody will use that unless you have a utility. Uh, there's also thin cell or thin film technology. This is uh, something that came out of the market 15 years ago, maybe, Rob, 10, 15 years ago, thin cell. Maybe 20, okay. See, he's from California. They get all the good stuff first. Um, so maybe 20 years ago, came out of the market. It's uh, basically like an inkjet sprayer. It's sprayed onto a, uh, this is a simple version. Uh, it's sprayed onto like a plastic substrate, which is, can be flexible. And so when you go to Canadian Tire and buy a solar panel, that's what you get, one of those. They're not as efficient, although the manufacturers will argue that they're getting close. Okay, so, so there's probably big improvements on it. It may well be that that's gonna be the future of solar, is thin cells. But at the moment, their price point is too high. You can actually get the traditional ones for better price than these thin cells that you see. This is a very small part of the market, maybe less than 5% of the market is thin cell. The price drop is killing these guys. When you hear about all these companies going bankrupt, it's all the thin, thin cells manufacturers. You know, they go out to market, they have an idea, they pitch the idea to investors, investors put up the money, they build a plant, they're gonna sell this stuff for five bucks a unit. When they get ready to sell it, all of a sudden the price in the market is $3 a unit. They can't do it. They just can't do it for $3. And so then they go bankrupt. And this is what happens. So there's lots of things on here. You can even get them off with peel off backings. You can stick them onto a metal roof and stuff like that. But then you risk damaging them because they're not covered with glass. Um, there's also this other one called billing integrated photovoltaics, which is like you get a shingle and it's got a solar uh, panel on it. The problem with those is that if they ever get damaged, they're really, really hard to repair, to replace, because you have to almost take the whole shingle off, off the roof. It's not very common. You see it in a few places, but it's really not common. Truly, for most people, that's what you're going to buy. Inverters. This is a central string inverter. This is a big box here next to the solar panel. Uh, this is a lightning arrestor in here. Um, this little box on here, this is a company that's come up with a very innovative product. There's no batteries on this. They have an outlet here. The power goes off. Your inverter has to shut down. And the reason for this is that when they go to fix the, the power lines, they don't want you uh, electrocuting the electrician who's fixing the line. Okay, so by law, these have to shut off. It doesn't matter what inverter technology you have, microinverter, power optimizer, central string, they're all gonna shut off. It's required by law. So, this company's come out with a system. You flip this little switch when the power's off, and after a few seconds, the thing reboots. And during the day, you can plug something into that and get power. At night, when the sun goes down, it shuts off, okay? It's just for emergencies if the grid goes down for several days. You can charge up your cell phone. Yeah, question? Yeah, the question is, uh, can you isolate the breaker? Basically, you turn this off, right? and then you're not sending power out to the grid, and then it's safe out there. Um, if this doesn't see voltage on it, it'll just shut off automatically. It's the way it's designed. You can get battery systems where you charge batteries and you get a, what's known as a transfer switch, automatic transfer switch. Power goes off on the grid. Your house becomes isolated, and you run off your batteries. You can do that, okay? But for most people, most applications, you know, if, I don't know the last time you remember the power going out for extended period of time. It, obviously, we should always be concerned about stuff like that, but um, um, these guys have come up with this little solution. And when I get to the next 
No, in a couple of slides I'll show you that where it's really going with this. So this is a central string. I don't think I'm going to spend too much time. It basically goes to a breaker here and mixes up with all the rest of your power. So this is the main breaker from the from Epcor coming in here, and this is the breaker from the uh, solar, and they just mix in the panel, okay? And so as a homeowner, you don't do anything. It's just electricity flow. It flows wherever it's needed, okay? So if you're not using it, it just goes out, it goes to your neighbor, he gets it, okay? So this buying and selling and all this other kind of stuff, you don't do anything. It just does it. This is the way electricity works. It just flows naturally. So there's no intervention from the homeowner. You just sit back, relax. Every now and then you look at the internet and see how much power you're making. Okay? I'm not going to spend too much time on this. This is a power optimizer. It's basically what is, looks like a central inverter, and these things go on, a, a little thing goes on every module. And this is a microinverter, which is a little thing goes in the back of the module, okay? And then you get AC power right off of that, okay? Now here's probably the future where we're going, because this is what they're doing in Germany now. So they've got so much renewables, now they have a problem. Now they need a storage for it, because the intermittency of renewables, wind, solar, it's true of all generation. None of it has storage, okay? But it's much easier to turn up the flame, turn down the flame, throw more fuel in, throw more, shovel more coal into the fire. If you do that, that's your battery, right? It's in a pile of coal outside. So we don't have that when the sun goes down. So in Germany, what they're incenting people to do now is add batteries into their system. So this is a lithium ion battery pack that goes onto the system. It's available in Germany now probably will be available here in a year, 18 months, something like that. It's enough, it's not a huge battery pack. It does a couple of things. It, you can use it for peak shaving. So in those jurisdictions that have time of day metering, where power is expensive during the daytime, you can actually switch to your battery if it's a cloudy day or something like that. And then the next day when the sun comes out, you can charge your battery back up, okay? So it offsets some of your costs that way. It can be integrated into a smart meter, a smart system, so that you're, you as a homeowner aren't doing this. Your smart home is figuring this stuff out for you, okay? And maybe your smart home won't let you do the dishes at four o'clock in the afternoon. Your smart home will say, no, nope, we're gonna wait till two o'clock in the morning because it's cheaper, power is cheaper, okay? So this is the other thing that's gonna fit into this. This is where the internet comes back into the home. We're gonna have smart homes, a lot of appliances now are getting these features built into them, okay? And so you're going to be able to control your home this way, and you're going to get more efficiency out of your entire systems that way, okay? What's the cost of that? Cost? What's the cost of that in Germany? I don't know. Um, it's a lithium ion battery. It's very similar to what you'd have on a laptop, but it's two kilowatt hours. It's a fairly substantial battery. Won't be cheap, but they have an incentive program for it, so they're helping to pay for it. So, how do I find an installer? The best way is to go to the Solar Energy Society of Alberta's website, and there is a thing here that says "Find Solar Providers." Little. This is the main menu. That happens to be in my building, actually. Look at that. So this is my office with all the solar panels. Um, so you click on that, and then you're going to get a list of companies. And when you go to the company's website, and this is not me, this is another company, you'll see a list of their credentials, okay, with little check marks as to what they're qualified on and any kind of certifications, whether they're a journeyman electrician or a master electrician, electrical engineer, all this kind of stuff. So you can see that. You'll also see photographs of all their projects, okay? And uh, so for you as a consumer, you can kind of cruise through that. The other one is the CANSIA website. CANSIA is the Industry Association, National Industry Association, so the Canadian Solar Industry Association. They also have a website. It's kind of more like a business directory. It's more like uh, white pages. Just gives you a list of all the companies. It doesn't really give you a lot of information, but at least you know that if someone's gonna pay a fee to register there, they're probably semi-legit. There is an old tried and true word of mouth references, of course. Obviously, make sure they have workers' compensation coverage because if they don't and they hurt themselves, they can sue you. So what workers' compensation coverage does is protect you, the homeowner, from being sued. If you have workers' compensation coverage and you hurt yourself on the job, you can't sue your client, okay? So it protects you, not the worker or the company. 
Also general commercial insurance they should have in case they burn your house down. And I would highly recommend if you see guys on their roof that don't have harnesses on, you kick them off your roof and send them on their way. Uh, fall protection is probably an indicator of how seriously they take their work, okay? Just, I got two slides left. Obviously the sun is a very reliable source of energy. If the sun doesn't come up tomorrow, we have problems. We have lots of problems, bigger than this, okay? And so when we don't have the sun anymore, we won't worry about it. Edmonton's truly one of the best solar resources in the world, okay? It really is. Dry climate, little cloud, it's cool. Cool is good. Cool is much better for solar than deserts. You see them in the deserts, and there's a couple reasons for that. One, land's cheap, and they have air conditioning in those climates, and solar works great with air conditioning. It's a, so as the air conditioner comes on, solar starts to produce electricity. They match themselves very well. It's a horrible place, technically, for the solar. They do not perform very efficiently in the heat, okay? And so when I talked about thin cell and thin film, thin film actually works slightly better than silicon wafer modules in the heat. So they actually have a role in utility scale systems in the desert. Very high reliability. They have what's known as a linear degradation. So ironically, ultraviolet radiation degrades them. If you want your solar panels to last forever, keep them inside in your garage. <laughs> but they degrade about 0.8% a year. What this means for everybody is after 50 years, you would only have lost 40% of their original factory specification. So if you bought a 100 watt module, after 50 years, it would still produce 60 watts. Go try and find a car that'll do that. What all manufacturers today do is they give you a 25 year performance warranty. They will warranty that you will get no less than 80% of the original value after 25 years, okay? And they do it because it used to be very expensive and people needed the reassurance. Prices, they're about 40%. This is all in price, turnkey price, everything. 40% of what it was three years ago, okay? Today, most homeowners, between probably $10,000 and $25,000, you can get a system on your home. The reason for the range is one house might use seven times as much electricity as another house, okay? The guys who use seven times, they, um, they have to pay about 60000 They won't do it. <clears throat> anyway, no moving parts. There's nothing to do, okay? The lifespan is usually determined by what it sits on, the roof, okay? So we usually give a 30-year wide lifespan-ish for asphalt shingles, and that's because you have to change the asphalt shingles. And if you take it off the roof to change the asphalt shingles, you have to pay somebody take it off the roof and put it back on again. And maybe you don't want to spend that cost for a used system. You can sell it. It still works. It's not dead. You can sell the system to a cottager or something like that who doesn't really care about the efficiency of it and put a new system on your house, or you can just put it back on your roof. It's up to you, totally up to you. So globally, there's been more solar installed in the last four years than in the previous 40, okay? So it's really ramping up, okay? Solar is really starting to dig in, all right? And you will see, as I mentioned earlier, it really disruptive technology for electricity utilities. Value of solar, this is my last slide. It's pollution free. This makes a difference to some people, particularly for me. We live, we burn half the coal in Canada. <clears throat> I don't know if everybody knows. <clears throat> Excuse me, I, I got pneumonia a little while ago, so suffering from a bit. But Alberta burns half the coal in Canada. So we talk about our carbon footprint or hear about our carbon footprint in the oil sands. That doesn't actually bother me as much as it does for the electricity sector. Um, there's no excuse to burn all that coal. We have better ways of doing it. Okay. A uh, homeowner can be independent of electricity increases. So basically your electricity prices from the life of your system is going to be what you paid for your system. You pay $10,000 for your system, it's good for 30 years. That's your electricity bill if, you, if it's sized for 100% of your consumption. Okay. Price of electricity goes up. You pay more for the electricity you buy, but you also get paid more for the electricity you sell. 
you're offsetting that increase. Okay? So if you're thinking about retiring or something like that, it's a great retirement plan. Take a little bit of your RSP, buy yourself a solar PV system, you've locked your electricity prices for probably the rest of your life. Okay. When you're looking at what it costs for this stuff, you also got to think about inflation, right? So you're buying it at today's dollar rather than at less money later, which loses money with inflation, right? Stuff like that. And you've also got the escalating cost of energy, okay? And as I showed you, transmission is going to double in the next five years. And that's not me saying that. That's the government saying that, okay? Buildings, in terms of uh, climate change, <coughs> Buildings use about 40% of our energy. Everybody thinks it's cars, right? We should have electric cars and we should drive hybrids and stuff like that. That's part of it. There's no question about that. <clears throat> but buildings are a substantial consumer of energy, okay? And so we have to keep that in mind when we're looking at things like uh, climate change. You know, we could wait for the government to do something, but this is something that's within the means of every homeowner, they can afford this, right? We live in a very rich society, ten, twenty-five thousand dollars $25,000, we've dropped that on a car easy without even thinking about it, right? So it is definitely within our range to afford it, okay? And then Rob's gonna kick me off the thing because I'm right out of time, I think. But I think we're gonna take a couple questions, Rob. Two questions. Anybody who wants to stay later and ask me questions, you're welcome to, yes? So the Department of Alberta, Alberta Energy has a division that is responsible for renewable energy. It's called alternative and renewable energy. The alternative is nuclear power, okay? So we get lumped in with nuclear power. They've been working on a policy for 10 years now. You know, the, the, the example I always use, okay, well, women didn't get the vote because the government decided it was a good idea, okay? Women got the vote because they demanded it. And then the government's kind of followed along afterwards, okay? Slavery never got abolished because the government thought it was a good idea, okay? I don't think necessarily that the government's going to leave this issue, okay? If it's something you guys care about, go to a candidate's forum, ask them questions, vote. I'm hoping the government will do something. We're working with the city of Edmonton. I think actually the city of Edmonton is in an area that's quite likely going to do something because they actually are committed to this. I don't see that level of commitment at the provincial level, okay? But maybe I just hang out with the wrong people, all right? But um, you never know. It would differentiate them from the past uh, leaders of the party. So uh, anyway, I don't want to get into that. It's the wrong form for it. Yep. So the question is, uh, you know, it, co it also obviously costs energy, material, whatever, to make these things. And uh, the rumor is, is that that's, you know, you never get that back with the solar stuff. They typically run about one to two years. Depends on the type of material they're made from. Okay. One of the issues I have with thin cell is the original version of thin cell was made with cadmium, highly toxic material. Which is okay when it's on your roof. Maybe it's okay when it's on your roof. It's a real issue when you want to take it off your roof and dispose of it. So the company actually has a recycling program for that. I'm still mm -hmm. not keen on that. Anyway, uh, there are other thin cells that use different technology, different chemical mixes from that. But the tr traditional silicone wafer module, it takes about a year or two. Um, and most manufacturers publish that on their websites. Um, so you put it on your roof. You generate electricity at eight cents a kilowatt hour or something like that, and a year and a half of that, that pays for the costs of manufacturing it, basically, okay? So that's, I would call that a myth, probably circulated by Exxon, maybe BP. No, I'm just kidding. That's two, but it's totally up to you guys. If you want to ask questions, I don't care. So the question is, is that uh, with the fixed charges, if I make, uh, if I offset totally w the electricity that I use with the electricity I generate, what would my bill be? I would still have the $5.91 a month, 
that goes to uh, EPCOR for uh, providing the meter and stuff. Oh, no, providing the bill. Sorry, it's for the bill. And uh, the 50 cents a day, I, I would have that for the meeting. Now, you can overgenerate. Is anybody from EPCOR here? I, I actually do on my house. I generate about 13 months worth of electricity in a year. Okay? I don't use very much electricity. That's like 20 bucks. I pay $230 in fixed charges. And if I get caught, I have to pay the 20 bucks back. Or I use my dryer once in a while. I mean, this is kind of an iffy thing, right? If you go on vacation for three months and you don't use your house, you turn, unplug everything, your consumption is going to drop, right? You're not going to take your solar panel off your house because you went on vacation, right? So this is kind of a wishy-washy kind of thing. It's a, basically a concept. They did it so the utilities, <clears throat> excuse me. They did it so the utilities wouldn't, wouldn't freak out. Okay, when they first implemented the idea, they have what they call these public consultations, and part of the public consultations with the utilities. And you know, they take it to the public, and the public goes, hey, this is a great idea. We should really do this. This is fantastic. And they take it back, and behind closed doors, the utilities come in and go, okay, now it's our turn. We hate this idea. We don't want you to do it, and all this kind of stuff. And so this is how they saw off the concession, okay? And so that's the way it is. You can do what you like. You can overgenerate. It's just that they don't have to pay you for it. Oh, I, for my building, my building is a true net zero. Uh, everything's electric. There's no gas in it, okay? And so our electricity, our heating is either from passive solar or from electric heat. But in my house, it's 85 years old. I have a natural gas furnace. When I go to replace the furnace, I might put something else in. Yeah. Yeah. We got to go.